is about leadership. It's about work-life integration. It's about integrating the different parts for mutual gain, but it's, it starts with the concept of leadership. When I ask you this question, what occurs to you? Let's hear the, the word or phrase that pops into your head when you think, what kind of leadership do we need now? We in this world, in this society, in this room. Integrity. Integrity, all right. What does integrity mean to you? In, in a word or phrase or a sentence. Values based. All right, so values based, yes. Sound judgment. Sound judgment about all matters in life, I'm sure, not just technical, and uh, all right, being able to make important decisions uh, based on useful knowledge, relevant knowledge, yes, Meredith? Global perspective. Global perspective, seeing the whole. What else comes to mind? Participative, someone who engages uh, all the people. Yes. What else? Passionate. passionate. Inspirational. Where does passion come from? Well, passion comes from the things that we care about, right? Inspiration comes from being able to express what it is that you care most about because that's what other people want from you. Is to hear your story, to hear what you're most passionate about, that's what people are inspired by. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next half hour or so and what that means for you. Again, I'm, I'm hoping that you're thinking here about what these ideas mean for you um, because I want you to come away from this, this time together with an idea that you can actually use. Um, what else comes to mind when you think about what kind of leadership is needed now? All right. Re rewarding just trying uh, and, and failure as much as success. Sir? What, um, what's the organization as a whole, not just the leader? All right. Looking, looking beyond just the selfish view and, and seeing the collective uh, and serving the collective purposes. Let's hear one more. Yes? Empowering others. All right. We could, we could spend the rest of our time together on this question, and in a sense we will, but. Um, let me just backtrack a little bit further here and, and give you a little bit of the context and why this model of leadership from the perspective of the whole person makes sense for our world today. It, it has to do with the kinds of things that you were just saying here. Um, <clears throat> the world that I grew up in and the world that you grew up in is clearly a very different world than the one that we're living in today. And yet a lot of the mental models of leadership that we carry with us, that we, were, that we learned growing up, uh, they, they reside still in our consciousness and they, and they shape how we think about what leadership is or should be. And that's, that's a mistake because the world is radically different. There are some verities of leadership that will never, never change and that have always been true as long as human society has existed. But there are aspects of how it plays out in the world today that we need to be conscious of and to think differently about what that means for us as leaders, as educators of leaders, as I as I take all of us to be in this room. We're all leaders here and we're all teachers of leaders. <clears throat> What's changed? Well, just very, very briefly, let's, let's look. Um, let's look at the social landscape. How have things changed? Uh, if you look at uh, the structure of the family. Today in America, uh, there are more mothers who are single than married under 30. More mothers who are single than married under 30. Um, one of the questions that we asked uh, our students back in 1991, uh, the undergrads when they graduated, and then th that we asked of the, the graduating class in 2012 was this one. Do you plan to have children? Yes, maybe, not sure, probably not, no. All right, so in 1992, what percentage of the Wharton undergraduate class answered yes to that question. You, you can't answer, Hannah. Because you, you know the answer if you read that personal time capsule. It was, it was uh, 80%, and it was 79. And it was the very same for men and women, 78, 79, it was the exact same. Class of 2012, class of 2012, these are the 22 year olds, just graduated. Same question, what were, how many said yes? 42%, right? What does that tell us about what has changed? Uh, a lot. 
Uh, we're not going to dig into all the sociological implications, but I just want to throw out some things just to shake up your thinking about what kind of world we're leading in today. Um, I, I just another, another piece from that study. Uh, we asked people, how many hours a week do you expect to work? <coughs> so again, this is Wharton undergrads, 1992. How many hours per week do you think they, on average, said that they expected to work? 56. All right, 2012? 70. And I think that's the preponderance of investment banking and consulting. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that has to be it. Um, so th things are shifting a lot in the social landscape. Those are just a couple of little tidbits. Uh, we look at the values that people have. Uh, one of the great benefits that I have in being you know, at Wharton for so long is that I get to see change. Uh, and I ask people all the time about what they care about. Uh, because it's the most important question, I think, to ask. What do you really care about? And so um, I've been asking questions like this, and I've probably asked some of you questions like this over the years. One of the questions I've been asking is about whether you expect to work in the same company when you graduate as when you retire. So back in the day, uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, Wharton MBA, uh, typical class, what do you think the percentage of people saying, yeah, that's my plan, same company all the way? It was, it was about 70%. Right. Now, when I, when I asked that very same question of a group of uh, MBA students in the full-time program in Philadelphia uh, not too long ago, about 70 of them, I said, how many of you plan to work in the same company when you graduate as when you retire? How many hands do you think went up? Zero. Well, there were two. And, and they were both heirs to major fortunes. <laughs> right. So there, there's all kinds of sh uh, shifts in how people think about what matters uh, in, in the workforce. Uh, there are many, many more people in, in our MBA program now who are really interested in devoting their lives and careers to healing the broken world around us. Uh, so many more than when, than when I first began. That, there is a huge social impact interest now. And indeed, that's one of the pillars of our, of our school. Uh, it's because we're responding to the marketplace, where students are coming in saying, I want to get the tools so that I can make the world better somehow. Uh, it's true. It's happening in a big way. Uh, we uh, just, just today just got a message uh, from a group of students who are interested in values uh, and, and making values the centerpiece of a Wharton education. And so I. Uh, they asked uh, a couple of us, a faculty, to lead a discussion about values and personal values. And you know, they just put up a, um, a sign up to, for uh, MBA students to, to join this conversation. 500 people signed up, um, which it's, 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 it's everywhere uh, in, our, in our student population. So values are shifting. People want to have meaning. They want to contribute in some, in some important way. The digital revolution, of course, has changed everything, um, as, uh, as you all know, and if, as if many of you are, of course, a part of that revolution, uh, directly in terms of the products and services you create and provide. But it's, it's, it's really shifted everything about the way we communicate and the way we connect with the people who matter to us. Uh, so the whole issue of what you pay attention to, which I think is a critical leadership issue, what you choose to invest your attention in, is, is in some way the, the, you know, the, the clearest signal as to what it is that you value, right? So how we get to the point of making intelligent choices about where we pay our attention, uh, both physically and psychologically, because you can be physically present but psychologically absent. What did I just say? <laughs> physically present, psychologically absent. All right. You are both physically and psychologically present, obviously, because you heard what I said. Yeah, but um, so let me just check my email for a second. <laughs> oh, sorry. You would never do that, I'm sure. What, what was your gut reaction to my doing that just now? Almost impolite and almost certainly not quite present. Not quite present. Um, yeah, I know we live with this all the time now, but you know, five years ago we didn't have this. So, 
the, the, you know, the remarkable power of the, of the uh, digital revolution, harnessing those tools, we're just figuring that out. Nobody knows where this is all going to go. Um, and like most other technological revolutions in history, the, the tool arrives before the psychological and social knowledge to really use the tools to good effect without their killing us, uh, you know, that lags. And so we're just discovering. So all these things and globalization and so many other factors have really shifted the landscape of what kind of leadership we need now. And so that's what I'm here to kind of challenge your thinking about. What does leadership mean to you today? And what should it look like? And what I want to argue is that um, it's got to have a couple of these attributes. Uh, it has to be about leading people, mobilizing people toward a goal that matters to you personally, not just to your business. So that's one important piece. It's got to focus on results, not just in one part, but in all the different pieces. And the, the, the pursuit of harmony among them must be a part of what it is that we seek as business leaders. It's about influence, not just top down, but in all directions, and again, in all the different domains, as I call them, work, home, community, and self. And the three attributes, and this goes back to our research starting 20 years ago, that we've, we've seen to be critically important are these. Authenticity, being real by clarifying what matters most to you, your values and, and your vision. Being whole, acting with integrity. The roots of the word integrity is one, integer, right? So how do you bring together the pieces into a coherent whole? By respecting the whole. And finally, being innovative. Acting with creativity by continually experimenting with how things get done. These three principles and how they come to life is what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about here because we found that, uh, that, they, that they work and that they make sense in many different kinds of contexts, uh, both um, in, in business and in society and not just in this country. Um, so it's about, it's about your whole life, not just about your work. 